Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today we're joined by Chris Vant Hoff, who has, we're talking about five years experience in sales ops, but previously had the finance background. So I'm interested to learn about how that's helped Chris in his more current role, currently the Director of Sales Operations at Honor. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I want to kick off by understanding that transition between finance and sales ops. Why did you do that? And did it turn out to be a good decision? Uh, yes. So when I was in college, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. So by default, I kind of just went to business school and said, hey, this seems like you can get a good job. Um, and ended up in finance because I like numbers. And you know, finance was good. Again, learned a lot of good basics around analysis. But... I didn't find it all that interesting, but I was very fortunate. I've always had a lot of experience working in early days. And when you work in early stage companies, you tend to get a lot of exposure to different parts of the business. Um, and the first early stage company that I worked for, Bronto, they let me be the Salesforce admin, despite no previous experience working in Salesforce. And I really liked that aspect of the job. I realized that you know everyone likes to do strategy. Um, in finance, you know, you get to do some, but you're, I didn't like the parts where I was stuck working with technical folks. Like I didn't know what engineering was doing or how to push back on budgets, anything like that. But when it came to sales, it, it was great because I understood kind of what is sales trying to do. There's number, there are numbers here that I can understand and I can figure out what's happening and then add my two cents as far as like, what's our strategy and how can I help inform that? Got it. So you, you were exposed to sales data whilst in finance, and that was the part of the finance role that you liked the most. Yep. And then just the other pieces of it, just getting to work in Salesforce, um, it was something new. It was, it was kind of these skills that I didn't, there's this role that I didn't realize that was out there in college. And I would love to see colleges, you know, especially business schools, start to you know look for opportunities because sales ops to me is something that again, a lot of business school students aren't even aware exists, but it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of a lot of businesses. And you get exposure to so many different areas of the business because of the, you know, what you're asked to do, that it's actually a really great first job out of college, um, in my opinion. So I would love to see business schools have a course or something that emphasizes sales ops because you know, I'd be happy to work with them. If there's any academics out there working, on, working in a business school, and I'd be happy to talk to them and help develop a sales ops course. For sure, even if it's just like a six-week lecture series, um, yeah. because it, it yep. teaches, it, they're going to understand the, the commerciality, the commercial side, but also the operation side. I'm sure they have like ops courses. I totally agree, Chris. So if anybody is listening yeah. and uh, you are you are anything to do with the business school, reach out to Chris, um, and maybe we'll, we'll, we will have sparked the first ever sales ops course in business school. Anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> back to the topic. Um, focusing on Honor now, could you share a little bit more about the sales tech stack that you're currently running? Yep. So just for a little bit of context, I've primarily worked in early stage B2B companies. So a lot of my experience is going to be relevant to, to that area. And in my experience with B2B sales, early stage companies, I try to keep things simple. Um, there are a million tools out there, but until you've got the basics down, and you can do a ton on just with Salesforce. So until you've got that down where people feel comfortable with your dashboards, data entry, um, that kind of thing, I'm not a huge fan of diving into other tools, but there are a couple that, you know, for example, we use MixMax um, for our sales team to do emailing, and that tracks opens, reads, all that stuff. Um, but beyond that, we don't really use much besides Salesforce and Mixmax. Um, we have troops too, which is kind of an e alert system for our Slack. But for the most part, we keep it to, we keep it to the basics, and that's worked for us pretty well. Cool, nice and lean. Um, and now I want to talk about the last few months. Obviously, quite a lot has changed. Yep. Um, how have you and the reps adapted to a more remote op operation, and what have been the challenges? Yeah. I, I mean, the good thing working with sales and you, you're seeing this more and more is a lot of sales team works remote anyway. So it's not as much of an adjustment from the perspective of working together. 
Um, I have seen people use Zoom more and use their video more, which is good because we do need that face-to-face interaction. The real challenge is in working with clients um, or in our case, partners. So our business model is a little bit unique in that we we do non-medical in-home care, but we work with local independent agencies um, where they're out there in the community and then we manage the, the workforce, the care pros. So we're looking for these partnerships with local agencies and that requires a lot of trust. You know, they've built these businesses themselves and for them to say, hey, yeah, I'm going to partner with Honor and give up my operations. That's a big decision. And it's a lot harder to build trust and rapport over a, over a conference call. You know, people get distracted. Um, they're not as willing to commit time. You know, it's a lot easier to push off a video call than it is to say, hey, if they're coming down to my office, it's a lot harder to be like, oh, sorry, by the way, cancel this. Um, so that's been a real challenge for us. And quite frankly, uh, I don't know that we fully solved it. Um, it's just a really challenging environment, especially with home care agencies who are so busy trying to manage their own business, let alone take time out to talk to us on a video call that, you know, it, so it, it's been a challenge, but we're working on some things to try to address that. Uh, Got it. Could, could you, would you be happy to share a couple of those things? Like obviously you mentioned using video more on Zoom, but is there any yeah. like tech or operational or cultural things that um, you are doing to try and address that relationship yeah. building problem? Yeah. So one of the things is we used to have people come on site for a full day, uh, you know, get to know the team. But now we kind of have to break that up because, again, you're not going to spend eight hours on a Zoom call. You know, people just you, you stare at your screen that long and, and you zone out. So splitting things up, um, looking for ways that you can help them with the COVID environment. So providing helping them find sources for PPE or personal protective equipment. Um, which was especially critical in the early stages when COVID really started um, becoming a problem. Um, so those are the types of things that show that, hey, we're helping, you know, we want to help. We want to be a part of the solution. We want to be a leader in the industry. And then, you know, no, there's no ask. We're not going to say, hey, we're only going to help you if you come talk to us. We want to be truly partners. Um, and if you want to talk to us down the road, great. But in the meantime, our focus is on on at the end of the day, the people who need care. Cool. And the, I, do you think that change will be temporary or permanent? Like, w- would that be good for you to ingrain into the reps forever? Like this whole value add, regardless of whether we're going to work together? There are definitely some things that will take away, you know, again, it, in sales, it's always about value. How do you help people? You, you know, these days, people get a ton of requests on LinkedIn. It's like, hey, we should talk. And they, they don't actually tell you why or they start going into the spiel about, hey, we're, we're, you have a problem, let us fix it, without actually understanding what, what it is you're actually doing in your business. Um, so those personalized touches where, again, you're just focused on helping instead of um, going into your spiel, I think are things that are universal. I mean, they're before COVID, after COVID, um, you know, just a back to the basics type of mentality from a sales perspective. Sure. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID, that's ebster.com forward slash COVID. Could you uh, share how targets or objectives have changed during this period? I know it must be a nightmare on the forecasting side, but how have you adapted that? Yep. So in early stage B2B companies, um, you know, you don't always deal with a lot, a huge sample size. That can make forecasting really tricky. And this goes back to some basic data science pr- principles of if you don't have a big sample size, trying to draw conclusions on that sample size is really challenging. So once COVID hit, all of a sudden, a lot of those assumptions that you had in the past go out the door. So you have to be creative about your forecasting process. 
So, you know, I use, I like to use the analogy to, I don't know if you're familiar with 538, but they're a political election forecaster. Um, Nate Silver, he's well known for his political forecasting models. They don't just use one method for their forecast. You know, they take multiple data points, not just, hey, what were the probabilities in the past? Or they don't just look at polls, they look at other factors like political donations or endorsements, things like that, that have been predictive. In the same way, I think sales ops can take that approach too of, one, you can do this top-down approach, which is your traditional probability-based forecasting. And not just probability that something will eventually close. I think one thing people ignore is the time element. Again, especially when you have longer sales cycles, it's not just what's the probability that it'll close. What's the probability that it will close this quarter? Um, so that's kind of the tops down approach. Then you have the bottoms up approach where the sales team is saying, all right, this is in my best case. So this is in my commit. Um, so ideally, those two methodologies kind of match. And then again, when you're dealing with a small sample size, you might want to get a little bit more granular and ask other stakeholders within the organization. You know, do you have partner or implementation teams? Do you have customer success, leadership? You can even potentially survey them to say, what is your confidence level that these deals will close? So you're not just relying on that individual salesperson to provide that color around your forecast. So those are kind of ways that you can balance out. Um, if you don't have a huge data set, you can still take those different methodologies and see how closely they line up. And then hopefully that gives you a little bit more confidence or at least a range that you can look at to figure out what what you think you'll hit for the quarter. Um, and so has that approach of the, with these two different strategies been working for you to forecast accurately over the past few months? So it, it, we've probably come in a little bit lower than what, you know, we had initially forecasted, but you know, the way I kind of look at it is again, when you're only dealing with a handful of deals a quarter, one thing people tend to do is extrapolate too much from a few data points. So let's say you're looking from a statistics point of view. If several deals are a coin flip, some of the, sometimes you're going to have a quarter where those coin flips just don't go your way. So you might have a really low quarter and everyone freaks out, but nothing's really changed. It just happened to be that that quarter um, didn't go as well. You know, you lost the coin flips. Other times you have a really good quarter and everything, everyone assumes that, oh, let's just jack up our forecast because we're on this uptrend when really you end up with this regression to the mean. Um, it, it's still too early to really know for sure whether COVID is going to be a one quarter decline or whether it'll be a longer term issue that we have to deal with. But it, it's very hard to um, extrapolate. I don't like to extrapolate too much at this point. So. Yeah, so do, do, just for the benefit of the audience, roughly how many deals are we talking about per quarter? Because I sense there is quite a low number because these are larger, larger deals. Yeah, yeah. You know, it can it can range from you know single digits, low single digits to you know double digits. Got it. So. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So you don't want to try and draw patterns from such a low amount of data points. Yeah. Sort of I sense. mean, there's there's always this there's this natural tendency for people to create a narrative. And admittedly, with COVID, there is a real narrative there. Um, but you have to really be careful of people's biases toward, hey, there's there's a story there. They're making up a story that doesn't necessarily reflect reality. It might just be, again, that one quarter. You might have just gotten a couple lucky deals in one area. Um, so I, I really try to take that long view of, you know, let's, let's not make, assume too much. Um, and that's where you have to have the conversations with the sales team. You have to be able to say, all right, here's the data that I'm seeing. Let's, let's ask questions. You know, let's make sure we're talking to the people on the ground. Let's talk to the people in leadership so that then, you know, if there is a narrative there that, you know, truly reflects the data, you can adjust to it. Sure. Cool. Um, metrics. Have any KPIs that you typically track changed in the last few months? And if yes, why? Yeah, our, our, our expectations for, well, things like quota, bookings, um, we've had to dial back some of those expectations. Um, we, 
we always we're still tracking a lot of the same metrics, but now we're kind of looking at the comparison of pre-COVID, co- pre-COVID, post-COVID. So if you're looking at time and stage, number of deals that are going, you know, the conversion rates, um, we're really trying to figure out where the biggest changes were in those numbers. Um, and, and we are seeing a certain, again, part of it is building that trust and that part where we want to bring people on site. That's kind of where we're seeing the biggest challenge because again, it goes from being, Hey, come check out our office, come meet the team to let's have this really long zoom call. And, and that's, you know, that's where I think you can extrapolate. You can say, well, there's a pretty clear pattern here. There's a pretty clear drop off in that stage. Um, so that's where we should focus our, our, you know, that's the new bottleneck. So how do we solve that bottleneck? Sure. Awesome. Really interesting chat, understanding how you guys are, are dealing with the virus with your sales process. But now I have two very important questions. Um, if you could go for lunch with one person in sales ops, all related to sales ops, um, that could either be someone that you know or, or would like to know, who would that be? So this is where I, one of the things from a sales ops perspective is, you know, I, I don't know exactly how, you know, I don't know what the day is that you could pinpoint that said sales ops came into existence and now it's this big thing. You know, Salesforce obviously was kind of a game changer and created, I would argue, probably created this function. Um, so I really like to look to other disciplines. You know, we always look for best practices within our function, you know, what we do. But because sales ops encompasses so many different roles, you know, you're a product manager in the sense that you're creating the Salesforce instance, you own the, the UI for Salesforce for your sales team. You're a data scientist because you own collecting data and turning it into insights and action. Um, you know, all these in finance, you know, you're, you're doing variance analysis. So for me, I really like to go outside the sales ops world and look for people who are experts in those other areas. Um, just because it, it broadens those horizons, broadens those conversations. Um, you know, as, as far as a specific person, uh, it, it, it's tough to say, you know, I've worked with a couple of people, you know, I, I really enjoyed working with Josh Davis and he, he's a good sales ops guy. He's consulting, does some consulting work. Um, but I also look to those other forums to really find out, Hey, who knows you know, who's got tips on how I can re- create a better Salesforce instance from a usability perspective? Um, who knows an approach I can take to our data cleaning that, you know, can, again, build those better outcomes for the, my, my analysis. Um, so, you know, I guess one person is it's tough to nail down. I said, I probably haven't done enough networking in sales ops, but I would just encourage people to not just look to sales ops folks, but look to those other disciplines because it can be really informative for what we're doing as sales ops. I totally agree. And it's almost any, any profession it's spending time outside of that profession in a related profession will f- definitely help you get better at your role. Um, so I totally agree. Chris, yeah, no, continue. Oh, sorry. And I was just going to add, and one thing, don't overlook it. We work with sales teams. Learn from your sales teams. Learn how they like to sell because then you can sell to them based on their selling style. Um, because again, they're your customers and getting their buy-in is really critical. Um, so if they like to be sold in a certain way or if they like to sell in a certain way, you know, mirror that. It's, uh, it can make your life a lot easier. That's such an interesting point. We haven't heard that in like 110 episodes, but that does, it does, you're assuming here that somebody likes to be sold in the same way that they sell, which I think is probably reasonable to assume. Yeah. I I mean, it it really depends, you know, maybe they see through it, but it's always important to build relationships. It's always important to understand what they're actual, you know, actually learn about them. Because if your only interaction with your sales team is when you're rolling something out or asking for something, um, then you're probably not going to, you're going to be missing opportunities to really help the team. For sure. Chris, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, it was my pleasure.